of years ago fit in with what we were singing. An old preacher lay dying. And a lot of his preacher friends gathered around me. And they said, now, you have won so many people to the Lord. And you have built churches. And you have helped so many people. And surely you have a great reward in heaven. And he just, no, 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 no. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Yeah, that right. It's not what we do gets us to heaven. It's what Jesus did. Our subject this morning is looking for a city. Aren't we all? Hebrews 11, beginning with verse 8. If you have your Bibles, if not, you can open the bulletin and it's printed out in the bulletin on the front page there, just inside. Hebrews 11, we'll read verse 8 through 16. Here's a man who was looking for a city. By faith, verse 8, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out, not knowing whither he went. So he did not know where the city was. All he knew is there was such a city. God had revealed that to Abraham. By faith, verse 9, he sojourned in the land of promise, as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. These, referring to the worthies who died in faith, these all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now, they desire a better country that is and heavenly, Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He hath prepared for them a city. Now, Abraham wandered all over the Middle East looking for that city that God had revealed to him. He never found it on this earth. But I can tell you with all confidence this morning that Abraham is in that city tonight. He's there right now. There's a big contrast between a tent and a city. You live in a tent, he did, and he looked for a city. Now a tent has no foundations. The wind can blow it over. But a city has foundations. And I noticed in verse 16, he hath prepared for them a city. Then if we go to John chapter 14, we will find that Jesus is speaking of that city. John 14, 1, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God. Believe also in me, or in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. Now, if you look at verse 16 in your bulletin, 
He had prepared for them a city. Then Jesus says, I go to prepare a place for you. You put those together. Abraham was told that he had a city prepared for him. That city probably had not been built yet. But God had promised Abraham that he was preparing for him a city. Jesus is the architect of that city. And you know it says here, he, they sought a city and a country whose builder and maker is God. And Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. The city that Abraham sought is a city Jesus said, I'm going to go and build, prepare for you. That where I am there you may be also. Now heaven is a word that has become a common substitute for God among the Jewish people. The Jewish people were so afraid that they might mispronounce or blaspheme the name of Jehovah that they would not pronounce it. But when they wanted to use that name, they found a synonym and they would use that synonym instead. They used Elohim and Adonai. So that way they, they all knew they were talking about Jehovah, but they didn't use Jehovah's name. And in the came to pass over the period of time that they did the same thing with the word heaven. To them, the word heaven meant God. Not that heaven is God. It is not. But that to them, the use of the word heaven was a reference to God. And so Jesus said in Matthew 23 that since they had been swearing by God's name using heaven as a synonym, he rebuked them for that and said that's a violation of the commandment. He that shall swear by heaven sweareth by the throne of God and by him that sitteth thereon. In other words, heaven stood for God in the way they were using it. Now, what kind of people are looking for a city today? Abraham, thousands of years ago, looked for a city. He looked for a city whose builder and maker is God. What kind of people look for a city like that? Not very many people. Not too many people are even interested in that kind of a city. When you try to tell them about that city, they don't want to hear about it. They'd rather hear about business affairs or life. They don't want to hear about a city whose builder and maker is God. They live for this world now instead of the world that is to come. What kind of people are they? They are people who confess that they are pilgrims and strangers in this world. Consider the characteristics of a stranger, a pilgrim. A stranger is one traveling to another country. Aren't we all? He is thankful for any kindness he finds in this world. A pilgrim is one who is glad for any good company he meets along the way. A pilgrim is one who, when he gets out of the way, he soon comes back and gets back on the right path. He is inquisitive about the way. He wants to know more and more all the time about that city that God has built. That city that's going to be His home for all eternity. He thinks often about the home that He's traveling to. He knows He has an excellent guide in the Lord. These are some of the characteristics of the people who are looking for a city. They are a people who have been regenerated by the grace of God. Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see nor enter the kingdom of God. They are persevering people. They're not, they're not 
Christians for one week or one month. They persevere to the end. They keep on keeping on. Jesus said no man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is fit for the kingdom of God. Christianity is a 24 hour a day experience. Seven days a week, 31 days a month. There is no turning back. There are persevering people. Then there are an enduring people. It says we through much tribulation much must enter into the kingdom of God. The Christian life is no bed of roses. It's a battle all the way. When Paul described the Christian life, you know what he chose? What terminology he chose to describe the Christian life? He chose a soldier. What does a soldier do? Set with his feet up on the desk and drink lemonade? No, no, no. A soldier pulls his sword out of his scabbard and he goes on the offense. He is a warrior. He's in a battle. He fights. The Bible says that we're to fight the good fight of faith. And that's a real battle. I don't know about you, brethren, but I find it's a battle every day of the week against the world, the flesh, and the devil. The devil never lets up on me. He's got something to say against me all the time. He's got something to put in my pathway all the time. It is a battle every day of my life. I've been a Christian 60 years. And it's no easier today than it was the first day I was saved. The devil is the same. God is the same. And the Christian life is the same. It is a battle. Satan will never give up on you until he can conquer you. But he will never conquer you as long as you walk with the Lord. So there are an enduring people. Through much tribulation, we enter in. Then there are humble people. Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. There will be no proud people in heaven. Nobody will strut up and down the golden streets of heaven and brag about what good He did on earth. No. The proud people will not be found in heaven. It's the humble. Those that know they're just sinners saved by grace. They have nothing to boast about. And all the good works they've done, they, they give God the credit because we are His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We can't take any glory for anything. For the moment we try to take glory to ourselves, we're robbing God of His glory. Don't ever rob God of His glory. Give God the glory and the credit for all that He's done for you because everything you've been able to do is because of what God has done through you. Then there are righteous people. They walk the walk. They not only talk the talk, they walk the walk. You won't find them in the places of sin. You won't find them among the dives. You won't find them among the ungodly. They walk the walk. They follow Jesus. Those that are looking for a city are a faithful people. The Bible says we are not of them that draw back under perdition. There are some who make a profession of faith. And for a year or two they go along. And then they fall by the wayside and you don't see them anymore. Some of them come back. Some of them do not. Those that are God's will come back. Those that are not His will not come back. They stray from the path and never return. Then they aren't expecting people for our conversation or citizenship is in heaven. 
from whence we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus, who shall change our vile body, that it may be fashioned like unto His glorious body, according to the working whereby He is able to subdue all things unto Himself. Those are the people that are looking for a city. I've been looking for that city 60 years. And I know someday I'll find it. Because someday He'll take me to it. What a wonderful hope we have. Then somebody says, but what is heaven? Is it just an attitude of the mind? Is it a psychological aberration? What is heaven? My friend, heaven is a place. Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. I'm from Fort Worth, Texas. That's a place. I love Fort Worth, Texas. But Fort Worth, Texas is not just a memory. Fort Worth, Texas is not a psychological name for something. Fort Worth, Texas is a city. It is a place. My home is real. But it's no more real than heaven. The city that I'm looking for. The city that Abraham looked for. The city that the saints of God looked for. That city is real. It's just more real than Fort Worth, Texas. And then again, the Hebrew word translated heaven is Shemayim. It's a plural noun form and it means the heights. That city won't be found on this earth. It's not down here. It's up there. The Greek word translated heaven is Oranus. And you're probably familiar with the word Uranus. We have a planet named Uranus. We named it after heaven because it's up high in the heaven. Both Shemayim and Uranus are used in Scripture in three different places. That is to mean three different places. And that's because Paul said he was caught up to the third heaven. One day Paul was caught up, whether in spirit or bodily, I don't know. But he, he was caught up into heaven. And he said it was the third heaven. There are three heavens. First, there's the atmospheric heaven. That's the sky or the troposphere. The region of breathable, breathable atmosphere that blankets the earth. In Psalm 147, 8, God covered the heaven with the clouds. That's the first heaven, the atmospheric heaven. The second is the planetary heaven. That's where our astronauts go, up among the planets, the stars, the moon. That's the second heaven. And the third heaven, spoken of by Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, is the heaven where God dwells. It's where His throne is. It's where He resides. Now He is omnipresent. He can be everywhere at once. And he can also be at home in heaven. These first two heavens will someday pass away, the Bible says, with a great noise. But this third heaven is eternal. It will never pass away. That's our eternal hope. That's where we're going to live. The King James Version uses this word heaven over 500 times in the Bible. In Psalm 33, 13 and 14, the Lord looked from heaven he beholdeth all the sons of men from the place of his habitation. He looketh upon all the inhabitants of the earth. So the Bible tells us he looks down from heaven, which is his habitation. God lives there, and someday we who believe will live there. In Matthew 5, 16, Jesus said, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Which is in heaven. Somebody says, well, where is heaven? 
Well, I can tell you scientifically where it is. We know where heaven is. First of all, heaven is up. It's not down here or over there. It's up. Elijah went up in the fiery chariot to be with God without ever dying. Jesus went up when He left His disciples and ascended into glory. He went up. So heaven is up. When Satan rebelled against God and tried to take over God's kingdom, the Lord spoke to Satan. And this is what He said to him. And incidentally, in what the Lord said to Satan also reveals where God's throne is and where heaven is. For thou, Satan, hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. So it's up above the stars of God. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation. That's where God is seated. In the sides of the north. In the sides of the north. And I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be, he said, like the Most High. So we know that heaven is above the stars. It's above the clouds. It's on the sides of the north. Science tells us that they have discovered a veritable Milky Way in the northern hemisphere that is infinite. It goes on out into infinity. And they don't know why that's there. And they don't know where it goes or what it is. Well, if they would read Isaiah 14, they'd have an answer to that question. That's the tunnel that's going up directly into heaven. That's the tunnel the angels come down to earth to look over and protect the people of God. So heaven is up. Now the only point in the universe that's up from every other point is north. People say up north, down south. The needle of every compass on earth points to the sides of the north. Astronomy teaches us that the only fixed point in the universe is the north star. Mariners use that as a guide when they get lost at sea. Everything in the universe revolves around the North Star. So God is big on the North. Somebody says, what are the dimensions of that city? Would it be big enough to hold all of us? Well, let me give you the dimensions and then you can answer your own question. First of all, the exact dimensions of that city called the New Jerusalem is 12,000 stadia. Now, stadia is equivalent, 12,000 stadia is equivalent to 1,400 miles or 2,200 kilometers in length, width, and height. Revelation 21, verse 15 and 16. A metropolis of this size in the middle of the United States would stretch from Canada to Mexico. It would stretch from the Appalachian Mountains to the California border. And even more astounding is the city's 1,400 mile height. Some people suggest it has the city's tallest towers and spires. We don't need to worry about heaven being crowded. The ground level of heaven, this city, will be two million square miles. I said two million square miles. This is 40 times bigger than England. This is 15 times, 15,000 times bigger than London. It's 10 times as big as France or Germany and larger than India. That's just the ground level. It's the same every direction. Height, width, breadth. The New Jerusalem, the city Abraham was looking for, 
the city I'm looking for, covers a surface area of 2.25 million square miles. That's a pretty good sized city. London is 621 square miles. The actual city of London is one square mile with a population of 5,000 people. On that basis, the New Jerusalem will house over 100 billion people. It's a lot of people. Revelation 7 and verse 9. John says, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palms in their hands. I've heard people say, well, heaven's just going to be a few people. No, it's going to be a lot of people. Now, compared to the population of the earth since its inception, it would seem like just a few. But when you stop and think how many God has saved, and He has planned this city to accommodate all those people, that's going to be a lot of people. No reason in the world why you shouldn't be one of them. Or me. Now, what's the description of heaven? It's a place of praise and worship. Worthy, they cry, is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. All the people in heaven are doing are praising the Lord, waiting for Him to return. Heaven is a place of happiness. He shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them on the living fountains of waters. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. I'm sure when we first get to heaven, there may be some tears in our eyes. And God will wipe away all those tears. And what does He mean by wiping them away? I think it means He'll wipe them out of our memory. And we'll not even remember them anymore. Heaven is a place of knowledge. Now Paul says, I know in part, then I shall know even as I am known. How do I know you? When you walk in here, I know you. How do I know you? I know you by sight. I know you by your facial expressions. I've seen you before. I see you again. I know who you are. How will we know in heaven who we are? We will know as we are known. When I see you in heaven, when you see me in heaven, you'll know me. I'll still have the same love. I think it'll look a little better. God will do a lot of work on it. The wrinkles will be gone. The old blemishes and spots will be gone. But I have a new body. It'll be the same body made new. You're going to live in this same body forever. But it won't be crippled, it won't be sick, it won't be old. It'll be a body like Jesus had. Jesus was 33 and a half years old when He left this earth according to His humanity. And we'll have a body like His. You read the things that He did and realize that our bodies will be like His. That's an astounding thing. He could walk through a door without opening. He could pass through a crowd invisibly. They couldn't lay hands on him. His body that hung on the cross is the same body that came out of the grave. It's the same body. This same Jesus shall also come in like manner, the Bible says. It'll be a place of knowledge. Now I know even as I am known. Heaven is a place of comfort, a place of health. There are no sick people in heaven. Heaven is a place of light and beauty. The emeralds that glisten in the walls of that city of pure gold on the streets, the gates of pure pearl. And those are not syllables. Those are not illustrations. Those streets of gold will be real gold. Those stones of jasper and emerald will be real. Those gates of pearl will be real pearl. You say, I don't see how that could be. 
it doesn't matter, it'll be that way. God said it would be. The God who created that heaven can make it like that. If you want to know about this city, you just read Revelation 21 and 20 and 21. John said, I saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, adorned like a bride for her husband. What a glorious day it's going to be. It'll be a place of reunion. For the Lord Himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of the archangel, the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So shall we ever be with the Lord. That's called the rapture. I believe in the rapture. I believe one of these days. And I don't believe it's far off. As we're going about our business, whatever day it may be, if it's Sunday morning at 11 o'clock, we just disappear out of this place. If we're on our jobs, we disappear. We'll be caught up to meet the Lord in the air without going through death. Just changed in a moment. It's going to be a place of fellowship with the Lord. Where I am, said Jesus, there ye may be also. God wants us with Him. I couldn't understand why God took my first wife with cancer. But I know He wanted her with Him. And God had to show me that she was not my wife, she was His child. And He had the right to take her home whenever He wanted her there. And I, I finally got that through my head. That she didn't belong to me. She belonged to me as a wife, but I, I didn't own her. God owned her. And when he was ready to take her home, he took her home. And I have no problem with that because I know she belonged to him. Somebody said, when did you, uh, I'm sorry, but you lost your wife. I said, I didn't lose her. What? You didn't lose her? No. When you lose something, it means you don't know where it is. I know where she is, so I didn't lose her. Place of reunion place of service. It's going to be a wonderful place. Somebody said, but what is heaven? Well, I'll tell you this. There is no purgatory. No purgatory. No place to atone for your sins. Because to believe that there's a purgatory, a place where you have to go and suffer and atone for your sins is to slight the work of Christ on the cross. Christ took your penalty, took your punishment on the cross. There's no punishment for you if you're a believer in Christ. And there's no atonement for you to be made. He made the atonement for you on the cross. He paid the debt that you couldn't pay. Hanging in my wall, in my office, I have a plaque. The plaque says, Jesus paid a debt he didn't know because I had a debt I couldn't pay. And I carry that with me everywhere I go and I keep it on my wall to remind me that Jesus paid my debt, the debt that I could not pay. So there's no purgatory to go to to atone for your sins, to be absent from the body, the Bible says, is to be present with the Lord. If you were walking down the street and a heart attack took you and you started to fall before you struck the ground, you would be in heaven. That quick, you would be with Jesus if you're a believer. No purgatory. No future punishment. All the punishments have been taken by Him for you. Then there's no second chance. Death fixes your destiny. The Bible says, as a tree falleth, so shall it lie. If you die lost, you'll always be lost in eternity. If you die saved, you'll be saved for all eternity. As a tree falls, so does it lie. 
I went to preach in a little country church one Sunday, and lying across the doorway was a great big round tree, a dead tree. It had fallen over right across the front of the church, the steps. And to get into the church, you either had to step over that log or walk around it and come back and go through the door. And I said to somebody, that log looks awfully old. When did that fall? Oh, they said about 30 years ago. They weren't very industrious about taking care of the property. And I thought to myself, as a tree falls, so shall it lie. And it sure was with them. But you see, God has given you some time to turn to Him and be saved. And if you fritter that time away, and you don't take advantage of it, and you die lost, you'll be lost for all eternity. No hope for you. No chance. No reprieve. To be saved, you've got to be saved in this life, now, not some other time. In Revelation 22, 11, the Bible says, He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. You see, the matter is settled forever that day. It never changed after that. In Luke 16, Jesus told the story of a rich man who died and went to hell. He said, beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from thence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. There's a great separation between the righteous and the wicked. The Bible tells us that the fearful and the unbelieving, the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake that burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second day. See, there are some people that will not be in heaven. They will never get there. They have never been saved, never will be. So they will never know the joy of heaven. They will face the fires of hell. What else is not in heaven? I was told about a visitor one time who died and went to heaven. The angel met him at the gate. St. Peter won't be at the gate. The angel met him at the gate. He said, I'll show you around heaven. And he said, all right. And they walked down the street a little while and pretty soon the visitor said, where are the asylums for the poor? They said, there are no poor here. Well, where are the hospitals for the sick? They said, we don't have any sick here. Where are the orthopedic crutches for the lame? Well, we don't have any lame people here. Well, where are the infirmaries for the blind and the deaf? They said, there are no blind and there are no deaf here. Well, where are the rest homes for the old people? The angel said, we don't have any old people here. Well, where are the graveyards for the dead? There are no dead people here. See, there's a lot of things that are not going to be in heaven. There's no disappointment in heaven. No weariness, sorrow, or pain. No hearts that are bleeding and broken. No songs with a minor refrain. We'll never pay rent for our mansion. The taxes will never come due. Our garments will never grow threadbare but always will be fadeless and new. We'll never be hungry or thirsty, nor languish in poverty there. For all the rich bounties of heaven, His sanctified children will share. There will never be crape on the doorknob, no funeral train in the sky, no grave on the hillsides of glory, for there we shall never more die. The old will be young there forever, Transformed in a moment of time, immortal will stand in His likeness, the stars and the sun to outshine. There's nothing in heaven that's not good. And 
I close with this little poem that I learned in seminary some 60 years ago, entitled, Will You Go? We're traveling home to heaven above. Will you go to sing the Savior's dying love? Will you go? Millions have reached that blessed abode, anointed kings and priests of God, and millions more are on the road. Will you go? We're going to see the bleeding lamb. Will you go? In rapture strains to praise His name. Will you go? Our heads the conqueror's crown shall wear. Our hands the conqueror's palms shall bear. And all the joys of heaven we'll share. Will you go? Their saints and angels gladly sing Hosanna to their God and King. Till all the arches of heaven ring. Will you go? Ye weary, heavy laden, come. Will you go? In that blessed house there still is room. Will you go? The Savior is waiting to receive. If thou wilt on Him now believe, that troubled conscience He'll relieve. Come and go. As we bow together in prayer.